family. Hi. Come on in if you're still in the foyer. Good morning to our friends who are online. Come on in, have a seat. We are so glad to see each and every one of you this morning. Uh, my name is Shelby Yarrick, and I am the music director here at RLC. I'm so glad. Well, thank you. I am so glad to be here with you this morning. Let's go through some announcements at, before we start praise and worship. If you are here for the first time this morning, we are so glad to see you. Um, you will have gotten a brochure from the ushers. You can fill out that section in the, part, the back part of it and tear it out. And please return that to our new welcome desk in the foyer. Um, and if anybody here has a prayer request, you can always find that information also in the back of your brochure. You can tear that out and you can put it in the offering tubes or give it to an usher or put it by the welcome desk. So let's take a peek at what is happening this week at church. Happy birthday first. Where is Sherry Holt? Sherry, are you here? Happy birthday, Sherry! <laughs> Um, other things happening this week, Wednesday morning, we have a half hour of prayer from 9 to 9.30 a.m. On Wednesdays, we also have life care. Life care happens on Wednesday afternoons in New Hartford. It also happens on Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. right here in Rome. If you are going to attend the one here at RLC um, and you would like to do that on Zoom, please call the church office. Our RLC men will be attending the Iron Sharpens Iron Conference on May 20th in Albany. The cost is $39, and you can sign up and find other information in the foyer. So now let's transition to the tithes and the offerings. I'd like to share my thoughts with you this week. Here is a quick refresher that our tithes and offerings can be mailed in. They can be done through push pay on the church app or dropped in those brown offering tubes on your way out. So some of you, story time, some of you don't know, I am a lap swimmer. And I was swimming laps the other day and I always joke that um, God likes it when I swim laps because I can't get away from him and he and I talk a lot. So um, God impressed upon me while I was swimming laps that I needed to talk about swimming for my ties reflection this week. For the past nine years or so, like I said, I've been developing my swimming skills. But when I was young, I was totally scared of the water. Getting in the water at all has always been an exercise in trust for me. I can remember being at SU, and that's where I learned how to swim, really, and getting in the lane closest to the lifeguard because I thought surely I was going to drown and I wanted them to be able to see me. I wanted to be right there. Um, but I had to trust that I would be saved if anything bad happened. Now, I swim in Lake Delta with my friends, and I still trust that God will keep me safe from the slimy fish. It's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke that my friends and I have. The lake has fish in it, except when I am swimming in it. There are no fish in it when I am swimming in it. So the Lord showed me that tithing is also an exercise in trust. When Taylor and I first got married, we had a lot of fear that we would have enough money to go around. And with baby number two on the way, we are still trusting God with our finances. God's word says in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in and rely confidently on the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight or understanding. In all of your ways, Know and acknowledge and recognize him, and he will make your path straight, and he will smooth removing obstacles that block your way. When we tithe, we are trusting God to be faithful. We trust that he will use the tithes to accomplish his will according to his word, and we know that his word says that his word does not return void. Let us pray today as we trust God with our finances.
Dear Lord, thank you so much for bringing us here today. I thank you so much that we can trust you to accomplish your will with our finances, God. And as we as we do this, Lord, we just pray that our finances we would be, our ties would be multiplied um, in your kingdom for your work. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, family, come on and stand up with me. Let's worship together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you are here with us this morning. Welcome and praise you. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven. Fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. Our hearts are open, nothing here is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy. God, let your fire fall down. Come on, the shout. Let us shout. Be your your renown fills the skies. We are here for you. Yes, Lord. We are here for you. Let your word move in power. Let what's dead come to life. We are here for you. are open, nothing here is hidden, you are our one desire, you alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, let your fire fall down, to you our hearts are open.
God is so, so, so good all the time. You know, sometimes, sometimes we go through difficult situations and, and we get kind of very focused on what we're going through, what we're dealing with, and we forget the one who's there for us and with us and is able to do anything and everything and wants to give you his kingdom, wants to show you his abundant life. And yet this, this situation that comes into our lives, it comes without us expecting it, and all of a sudden it just gets right in our face. And we have to be able to push it back and say, you know what? There's somebody bigger and better than you. And realize, realize you're not alone. And no matter what goes on, no matter what goes on, no matter what goes on, there is joy. Not in this building, because that's not the house of the Lord. There's joy in you. There's peace in you. There's hope in you. There's life in you. And you can just settle into that rest. The Bible talks about the rest of faith. Why is it a rest? Because we've got our eyes 
securely and continuously focused on our Lord, who never fails. Amen. God is so good. Thank you, Lord. Well, if we have any children from six weeks to sixth grade, they need to head over to the rainforest. And any uh, youth from seventh grade to 12th grade, they can head over to Quest. The rest of you, if you just want to turn and greet somebody around you, you can greet someone and be seated. Isn't it nice to feel the sunshine? We knew it was coming. And hopefully it stays for quite a while. But, uh, you know, whether the sun shines on us or it rains on us or storms on us, we know the sun's always there. There are things that get between us and, and being able to see the sun. And it's just like life. Sometimes there are things that get between us and our ability to to really focus on, on our Lord. But it's, it's as much as, as faith is a rest, the Bible says we're to fight the good fight of faith. And the fight isn't against flesh and blood. Whenever we have a battle, whenever something's going on, if it's, it appears to be with somebody else, understand your fight isn't against that person. Because who loves that person? God does. And we need to love them too. Who values that person? God does. And we need to value them too. And we need to recognize that the enemy is behind what's going on in that person. Now, that doesn't mean they're possessed. Because you and I as Christians, we, we let the enemy get his way in our lives sometimes. We do things that, that are opposed to what God's word says. We do things that God would never want us to do. And, and we just... We end up being deceived and falling prey to it, or we end up just choosing something that we know is not what God wants, and yet <clears throat> the enemy starts working. And in the midst of that, we've got to be able to see beyond what's going on to who that person is. That person is made in the image of God. That person is so loved by God and so valued by God that he gave his only begotten son for them. They may not even know it, but the only way they're going to know it is if we live that love out to them in spite of what they're doing. Because in that happening, that love, that goodness that we show from God to that person is something God's going to use to draw them. It's what happened with each one of us. Somehow, through someone, God got through to us and drew us and continues to draw us so that we can do that same for others. And there are so many people that are in such difficult situations. Now, a saved person, someone who has Jesus as the Lord, we can be in difficult situations and never lose hope because we know we're never alone unless we let it go. But people that don't know the Lord don't have anything more than what they have, their resources, their wisdom, their, their abilities, uh, they're going to be hopeless. And we're living in a world full of hopelessness. And yet the God of all hope, who fills us with joy and peace and believing that we would abound to even more hope, lives not in buildings like this, lives in you and wherever you go, you bring the person of God, the presence of God, the power of God, the kingdom of God. And so don't be surprised 
Don't be surprised as, as things begin to deteriorate and get more chaotic because it's going to, the Bible tells us it will. We don't have to fear and that very, very absence of fear in our lives is going to be something that is going to cause people to begin to question. Begin to question, how, how can you have peace? How can you have hope? How can you have joy when we're hearing all the things that we're hearing? And they may even come to you and say, well, what, what's, what's your secret? What are you on? Seriously. And, and we have to be prepared to give an answer. Give an answer of why. Why do we have peace? Why do we have joy? Why do we have hope? Why do we have this confident expectation of good? That's what hope is. Why do we have this when we're hearing all we're hearing and, and everything that people are predicting are going to go on? Why? Why? And you can say, it's not a why, it's a who. It's somebody who loves me. Oh, you got somebody in your family that's really rich? Yeah. You have somebody in your family that's really powerful? Yeah. You have somebody who's really connected? Yeah. Is it an uncle? No. Is it an aunt? No. It's my father and my brother. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and his heavenly father, who is your heavenly father. And you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. Instead of worrying, worrying is just being focused on something and thinking about it, meditating on it, talking about it. Instead of doing that, focus on the promise, not the problem, and meditate on that and talk about that. And you will be able to move from wherever you were up, going from glory to glory as God takes you as you trust in him. Amen? God is so good, so good. And yet we, we, we have at times questioned him. Oh, maybe you have and I have. Uh, where things will go on and I'll be like, God, what, what's going on? Why? You know what? I don't know if I've ever had the answer to my whys because it, it really doesn't matter why. What really matters is what God's going to do about it. And he has a promise for everything we face to help us be overwhelmingly more than conquerors in all things because he loves us. Amen? Amen? Today we're continuing on. We've been learning about the fear of the Lord uh, and, and how there are things in, in our lives that only God can do. But we've, we've got to have an expectation. We have to have a reverence. We have to have a trust in God, a confidence in God so that we'll obey God. And when we obey God, God has his way in our lives. Understand this, that God is not going to have his way in anybody's life that doesn't want it. That's why everybody isn't saved. Everybody can be saved. But not everybody will choose to. And even those of us that are saved, we have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. God will not force his will, his life, his way on us. We have the freedom like never before to be able to choose. Are we going to have God and his way and his will working in our lives, or are we going to have something else? And if we have something else, understand it's not going to produce what God has promised. There is not an abundant life apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. There's existence, and that doesn't go too well most of the time. But God wants you to prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. And the only way that happens is as we look to and trust in God. And when we do, we realize that there's nobody like God. Man, you may know some powerful people, but nobody knows anybody more powerful than God. You may know some, some knowledgeable people, but nobody's more knowledgeable than God. And yet we, we look to all sorts of other sources before we look to God because 
we're relying on what we see and what we feel, and, and God's more real than what we can see or feel. He's always been and he always will be. But we've been learning about the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord isn't, it, it, there is a part of it that we're going to be studying in the future, but um, the fear of the Lord is about reverence and respect and honor, which moves us into a place of trust and which moves us into a place of obedience. But I gave you a definition of the preeminent adoration and, and awe of God. And preeminent is uh, to have God in the first place in our life. He's the priority above anything and everything else. He is the most valuable thing in our lives and he's most influential in our lives. So that's preeminent. Adoration is, is a fervent, devoted love and worship of God. So he's, he's the top of the tops. So there's no one that comes close. And it's, it's a battle for us because there are so many things that pull on us every day to want to take that first place. We want the first place sometimes. Other things uh, we want to put in that first place, but when God is not in the first place, everything's out of place. And so we've been learning about this fear of the Lord, and, and in, uh, <clears throat> in 1 Peter chapter 2, this won't, this won't be up on the screens, but a couple of weeks ago, we ended with 1 Peter chapter 2 and how 1 Peter talks to us and tells us about authority, but it also tells us that uh, we are to do four things. There are four things. Uh, we're to fear God. We are to love the brethren, love our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's not just a, a smile and a wave at somebody. When we love, we love in deed and in truth. All right, that means we're willing to put our lives on the line because G God so loved the world, what did he do? He gave his son. And the son so honored and revered and loved his father, what did he do? He gave his life, right? And so love has an action to it. You can't say, I love you, and then have no corresponding action. That's a lie. And yet it happens all the time. Hey, I love you, but there's no interaction. And so we, we, we see that we're to love the brethren. We're supposed to be there for one another. All of us need help. Some of us need more help than others. But we all need help. And the Bible says it's more blessed to give than receive. When you step in to help somebody else, do you realize, maybe you don't, that, that God is very aware of what's just about to happen, how you're about to help somebody else. And in that moment, God considers what you've done for them, you've done for him. And the Bible says you can't give without God, number one, recognizing it. He'll never forget your labor of love. Not only recognizing but multiplying that back to you. Now, we don't give to get. We give knowing we will get so that we can give even more again. And that's the unbroken chain of part of us going from glory to glory. And so we fear God, we love the brethren. Then it says in the verse in 1 Peter 2 that we honor all people. Now, this is, these things we're not seeing at all in our society. We don't see people having a reverence for God, an honor for God. We're not seeing people love each other. We're not seeing people value each other, honor each other. And then we got to the last one, and it says honor the king, which is about authority, which we all love, don't we? <laughs> That's not a trick question. But we've grown up in a world where authority isn't perfect. Is that correct? And because of that, we have trouble when we hear about authority and getting a biblical view on it. We all have our own opinions. Our, own, our, our opinions are like noses. Everybody has one. They all smell differently. All right? But as Christians, we have made a 
choice to receive Jesus as our Lord, as our master. All right? So he's the one that, that rules our lives. And so his ways should be our ways. We should be people that when we say Jesus is our Lord, people can look at us and say, oh, so what you're doing is what God would have you do? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> but but what's, what's the beef that the world has about us Christians? Hypocrites. We're hypocrites. And, and there's a good reason for that. Because we say we are Christ followers and yet we don't follow Christ. And sometimes it's because we want to use the Bible as kind of a buffet. You know, the Bible says, buffet your body. Oh, I'm sorry, it's buffet. <laughs> but when you go up to a buffet, how do, you, how do you handle that? If you see stuff on it you don't want, do you have to take it? <laughs> no. Nope. You take what you like and leave the rest of it alone. And, and a lot of times Christians deal with the word of God that way. Well, I really like this. And I really don't like that. So I'm not going to think about that, and I'm definitely not going to do that. I'm just going to do more of this. Now, if, if we, we realize that what we're doing is we're rejecting God's word, his word is life and health to those who find it. His word is truth, and it sets us free. There's nowhere that I I've ha have ever read in the Bible where the word makes us comfortable. And many times that's what we're looking for. The Bible says the Spirit of God will comfort us, but many times we find out things in the Word of God that make us very uncomfortable because it's a tension that builds in our lives where we say that Jesus is our Lord, this is what his Word says, and we don't want to do it. So how do, we, how do we rationalize and justify the fact that he's our Lord, but I'm not doing that? You can't. And you know, the amazing thing is God won't force us. Even though it's best for us. And so when we get to things we don't like, we'd rather ignore them, read around them. If, if the truth were to be seen in our Bibles, we've erased a lot of things in our Bible because we just don't like them. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear about that. And so today we're, we're going to continue on talking about authority because what would happen in our world if there was no authority structure? It would be absolutely wild, not in a good way. If nobody obeyed the authority that is seen right on the streets that you drive on, we're, we're, what authority? Talking about the traffic lights, people are running those all the time. Yeah, they are. Do you know that now, nationally, they are putting a longer time between the green light when it turns red from this direction to the green light to this direction? They are programming the time longer and longer because people are flying through the red lights. I don't know, there may come a time where it doesn't matter, they're going through whatever. And what does that do? What does that do to our safety? We don't have any. It becomes chaotic. It becomes deadly. And that's what happens when there's no authority. I, I shared with you months ago where the Bible tells us in the book of Judges at the end that everybody, there was no king in the land and everybody did what was right in their own sight. That's really applicable to our society today. You know, if you don't like the president, we don't have a president. Help me. I'm really needy, I need some help this morning, okay? Just because you don't like the president 
You say we don't have one? Now who's, who's, who, who's not dealing with full deck? Huh? David didn't go out to the battlefield and say, I don't see any giant. There's no giant here. Man, if he had done that, his head would have been taken off. All right, you don't like the president. But guess what? The president isn't the highest in authority. Well, he's the highest in our country. No, he's not. No, he is not. Why are you looking so low? God is authority over all. It's true. Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, I think it's verse 19. Again, this won't be up there. He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Does Jesus lie? Who has all authority? The Lord. So you don't have to fear. Even though things are a little crazy, even though things don't go the way you want, even though things are going towards more towards what the enemy wants, understand God's still got it under control. And we learned, we learned that every authority that's in authority was placed there by God. I can feel the tension already. And so I'm just going to pray. Heavenly Father, we need your help every day, but we're asking for your help today. Father, help us to gain insight and understanding in truth because your word is truth. Father, help us not fall prey to the spirit that's at work in this world, the spirit of rebellion the spirit of chaos, the spirit of the enemy. Father, we have your spirit in us. Help us to embrace the spirit of truth, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the spirit of grace. Today, help us to recognize where we've rejected your truth and in essence rejected you and where we need to turn around and embrace your truth so that your life would abound in us and through us. And we thank you, Father, for this. In Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. All right. So in Romans chapter 13, we're going to kind of get a running start from something we looked at last week. But Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, it says this. Who wrote this? Paul. And, and Paul was inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says every word in the Bible, every scripture is inspired by God. God breathed. And so God was having Paul write this, and he wrote this letter to the church at Rome. Let that sink in. Because it applies today. Let everyone, leaving out no one, be subject to the governing authorities. For there is what? No authority except that which God has established. Now, that grinds in all of our, 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 you know, insides. It's like, what do you mean? I know some people that were in authority. They couldn't possibly be there by God. Listen, it didn't say every authority that's in authority is doing what God wants. How many of you that are Christians know that you can do what God doesn't want you to do? Duh. And, and so it happens. God, God puts somebody in authority for a purpose and they may not do what God wants. But how many of you know God can take care of what anybody does? So there's no authority except that which God has established. The authority that exists has been established by God. Isn't it interesting that he had to say it twice so we get it? This is important. Because if God established the authority, 
there's an honor we need to give to that authority whether they're doing what God has for them to do or not. There, there is an honor because when we honor authority, we honor God. When we dishonor authority, we dishonor God. Now, none of us would want to dishonor God, would we? And yet the enemy deceptively tricks us into dishonoring authority in, in our society and in essence, we dishonor God. So we're putting a barrier between us and God. We're putting distance between us and God and not even knowing it, thinking, man, I've got a right to do this. Well, you do. You have every right to do it that you want to, but don't call yourself a Christian. Because I can't follow Christ and dishonor authority because of what the word says unless we want to cut these areas out, which I don't advise. It goes on to say, consequently, whoever rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will what? Bring judgment on themselves. We bring judgment on ourselves when we rebel against the authority. Now, does that mean... Does that mean I have to do everything the authority tells me to do? We're going to see that's not accurate. But we can't just fluff off authority and do what we want to do. Because we're never supposed to be doing what we want to do. We're always supposed to be doing what God wants us to do. Is that right? The Bible says we were created for his pleasure. We are, we are his ambassadors. We represent him in the world. And yet we can't represent him and go against what he's said. And this says we're to honor authority. But understand this. This is delegated authority. Every, every human authority is delegated authority. God has established authority in three main areas. In the family. Which today, the world we live in is trying to redefine. And they can do anything they want to do. We don't have to embrace it. We have to be able to stand strong and knowledgeable and loving. And when somebody else presents what they say, you know what? Anybody can believe anything they want to believe, but I don't have to believe it. I don't have to embrace it. And I will not celebrate it. So there is authority in the family. God is the head. The husband the wife, the children. Now, does that mean there's more value to a husband than a wife? No. It's just different roles. Different functions, different purposes. Well, I don't like that. Okay, you don't have to like it. If this is all about you, do what you want to do. But don't expect God to get involved. Whatever you do, you have to maintain. Whatever we do when we follow God, he's responsible for. So in the home, there's authority established in civil government. The government, the society, he's established that. And also in the church. There's authority in the church, there's authority in society, there's authority in the family. And you know what we want to do with most authority? Forget it. If we're not in authority, we don't want to have anything to do with authority. But understand, if we do that, chaos is going to abound. God is not the God of chaos. God is the God of order. And yet, there are people in authority. There are husbands that have said, you know, I'm the head of the house. But they weren't being the authority under authority. There are authorities in our civil society that are saying, I'm an authority, but they're not under authority. In the church, there are people that have had a position of authority, which is responsibility, and not been under authority, have done things that are contrary 
against what God says should be done. And so we have to deal with the fact that God's established authority and yet every human authority, whether it's in the home, whether it's in society, whether it's in the church, is a flawed human being. And so when, when is it that we, we follow the delegated authority and when is it when we can say, you know what, I see that you're an authority but you're not under authority and so I have an authority that's still in place and that's God. So this delegated authority, if a husband tells a wife to do something that is against God's word, he has taken himself out of the place of authority, delegated authority. And so that wife has to submit to God, to his word, to his ways. And, and we went through a series, a couple of series in this church a long, quite a long time ago. And I would encourage every one of us to renew that information or get it for the first time. And, and the series were Undercover and Honor's Reward. It's very important for us to understand these kingdom principles because without it, we're going to be like in the book of Judges. We're going to do whatever's right in our own eyes. And I'm going to tell you, we have all shown clearly that we can't be trusted. <laughs> I knew I wouldn't get anybody to agree with that, but it's still true. We all know it. There's only one we can trust, and that's God. And so when a, a delegated authority does not maintain, when it's delegated, it's supposed to fulfill what the authority that gave them that authority has for them to do. When they don't, they come out of being under that authority, and we still have to report, we still have to be accountable to the final authority, and that's God. Does that make sense? Okay. So we see this tells us that God's established the authority, but sometimes that authority doesn't do what God wants and basically disqualifies themselves to be an authority and yet many times still remain in authority. And so we, we need to realize that, that God has a way that we can honorably not obey what we're being told, but it can't be just, I don't want to do it. We have to be really, really careful that we are not just saying, well, you know, who made you the boss of me? I don't want to do it. Understand, if it's not unscriptural, if it's not illegal, if it is not immoral, and if it is not unethical, then we really don't have a basis to disobey authority because God put them there. Well, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. I understand you don't like it. I understand you don't agree with it. Guess what? Where are we all going after this part of life? Exactly. <laughs> Thank God, heaven. Guess who's going to have their way in heaven? <laughs> Not us. <laughs> it's going to be God. We get there and the only one that's going to have their way is God. That's what makes heaven heaven. God is having his way and it causes that location, that place, that environment to be heavenly. It is obviously not heaven here on earth, but we can experience heaven here on earth as we submit to God, allow God. Now, I didn't say it was going to be easy or pain-free, but we can have all of heaven available to us in the midst of this broken world. And I'm telling you right now, I need more of heaven in my life because the world's ramping it up, isn't it? And the only thing hindering me from having more of heaven in my life is me. 
How much am I going to just give myself to God? How much am I going to let God uh, govern me and guide me and guard me instead of me pulling the plug sometimes and saying, well, I think this is better. I don't know what better is, but God knows what best is all the time, and I need to trust him. So we're going to look at some people. The first one we're going to look at is, uh, actually, we're going to go to Titus. It's not a book we go to often, but Titus uh, is, is a book where it talks about authority too. It says this, remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities and be obedient. Obedient. Be ready to do whatever is what? That's the key. Be obedient. But if they're telling you to do something that is unscriptural, immoral, illegal, or unethical, you can't follow them because you still have to follow God. God wouldn't have you do something unscriptural, would he? God wouldn't have you do something illegal, would he? God wouldn't have you do something immoral, would he? God wouldn't have you do something unethical, would he? No. And so in that moment that that delegated authority tells us to do any one of those four things, they've moved out of that place of authority. We still have to report to the final authority in our life, the Lord. We have to fulfill his word. When something comes against the word of God, we can't go with it. No matter how many people say this is the right thing. And we are having such pressure. It's amazing to me today that there's been such an outcry against bullying and yet bullying is being used against Christians all the time. You better agree with me. If you're not, you're prejudiced. No, I'm, 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 I'm honestly not prejudiced. I love God. I just want to do what God wants. I can't, I can't agree with what you're saying because God doesn't. His word doesn't agree. How many of you like taxes? <laughs> Texas. Yeah, Texas. Texas is okay. Taxes are not. <clears throat> but do you know, do you know that, that Jesus, two times that's recorded in the Bible. It probably happened more than that. Two times, he was, he was called out on taxes. Guy came to him and said, uh, to one of the disciples that was with him and said, does your master uh, pay temple taxes? Now, the temple was obviously the religious organization at that time. And, and he said, uh, yeah. And so not to offend them, Jesus sent Peter down to the river with, to fish. And he said, catch the first fish, the coin that you find is in the mouth, take out and pay the temple tax. Do you know, he stuck his line in and there was the coin. Another time they came and they were trying to trap Jesus. And they said, does Jesus pay the Roman tax? And Jesus said to him, let me, let me see a coin. They gave him a coin. Jesus should have said, thank you for your donation. <laughs> but he looked at the coin and he said, whose face is on it? They said, Caesar. Jesus said, you give to Caesar what's due to Caesar, but you give to God what's due to God. Jesus submitted to authority as long as it didn't violate what his father had for him to do, what, what the kingdom of God was all about. And in Luke, we see Jesus not just submitting to these higher up authorities, we see the first authority that God established outside of his own. Um, we see that he, he established this, this authority in the family, but I've got to finish this. Uh, let me go back to Titus, sorry. Thank you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities and be obedient. Whatever to whatever, ready to do whatever is good. To slander no one. I'm telling you, folks, this is one of the most uncomfortable messages I've had to bring in a long time. Because whenever we have an election year, and just after election year, 
People run their mouths. Everybody's got an opinion. And I have always said, if you don't vote, you don't talk. You have no right to talk about anything you weren't involved with. And if you do vote, don't talk bad. To slander no one. To be peaceable and considerate and always be gentle towards who? This is God's word. This is not a buffet. We can't just say, well, you know what? We got a real jerk as a governor. <laughs> You're telling God that the authority that's there is not right. Are, are, are you ready to back that up? No. I don't understand. I don't understand a lot of things. But I do know one thing. There's one thing I know. Whenever I go against God, I am wrong. Gentle towards everyone. Slander no one. But it's not slander, it's truth. All right, let's, let's just take it as that, okay? It's truth. You're telling the truth. You want people sowing seeds like that for you? Because you're sowing that, you're going to reap. How do you want people to deal with you? Critically or mercifully? I know these are ridiculous questions, but it makes us think. And all of a sudden we stop and we say, you know what? I don't want that harvest. So I got to change what I sow. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but don't run your mouth. The Bible tells us it's real tough because it's a little member, but it's, it's on fire from the fire of hell. Goes on to say, for we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived. It's not anything we want to embrace, but it's true. We were foolish, disobedient, and deceived. Understand there's still deception working in all of our lives. There's still disobedience working in all of our lives. There's still foolishness working in all of our lives. But we're moving, hopefully, out of that, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. When you and I read this last, last verse, verse 3, disobedient, deceived, foolish, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. It's, it's describing our society. And we as Christians are in this world, but we're not of this world. We are not supposed to be acting like everybody else. The Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness in high places. And what's happening is we're trying to fight fire with fire, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. No, 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 no. The word of God to us as New Testament believers, we're to love our enemies. We're to bless them. We're to pray for them. We're not supposed to malign them. I'm telling you, as I have been studying this and, and meditating on these things, I'm looking at the church and I'm saying, oh my gosh, God, we are so far out of alignment with you. We have justified and rationalized all sorts of activities, actions, and things that are just absolutely as opposed as there are leaders that are going against God's word. We're opposing God, God's word. How can we ever expect God to be able to move when we're as rebellious as people that don't know God? And this is why the heart of God breaks. Jesus is coming back for the church, for us. But we're supposed to be without spot or wrinkle. 
That means this stuff that we're doing that's just like the world has to go. If we're gonna be a part of what God's doing in these last days, we can hold on to all this stuff. We can do what we've always done the way we've always done it and get what we always got. Or we can choose to let go of those things that have been part of our before Christ life and embrace the things God has for us and be a light in the world and a salt in the earth. So with this, we're gonna look at Jesus' life. And in Luke chapter two, Jesus is, is, we don't have a lot of information. We've got a lot of information about Jesus being a baby and what, what went on. And then there's this period we don't have a lot of information. And then we have this information that Jesus, they had returned Mary, Joseph, and Jesus had returned to Nazareth to live after, after the king slaughtered all the kids that were the age of Jesus. Can you imagine what it was like? Jesus come back, comes back to Nazareth, and there are no kids his age. Kind of a five-year gap. All the male children are dead because the king killed them, trying to kill Jesus. But his parents took him down to Egypt. Now they come back. They're there, and, and they're going up from Nazareth to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And it wasn't like they got an Uber or they jumped on the bus, Gus. He, he, he had to walk. And so there was this pilgrimage, people going to Jerusalem, hundreds, thousands of people going to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Passover. And they celebrate the Feast of Passover and they go to walk home and Mary and Joseph think Jesus is with somebody else in the family. And they get back to Nazareth and they find out he wasn't. Now, think about this. It's amazing because for three days they search for him. How do you lose God? <laughs> Better than that, how do you tell the father I lost your son? Uh, Heavenly Father, I don't know how to break this to you, but he's gone. But think about Mary and Joseph. I, I remember there was a time we had not lost. They knew where they were. We just didn't know where the boys were. And this panic shot through Deb and me. And it was paralyzing. And it was debilitating. And for Mary and Joseph, for three days, they don't know where Jesus is. And they're searching all around. They finally go back to the temple. And there they find Jesus. He's seated with all the scholars. He's listening and he's speaking and they are just amazed. And, and so verse 46, so now it was after three days they found him in the temple sitting amidst the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. When he saw them, when they saw him, they were amazed. His mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? My mom wouldn't have said that. <laughs> there would have been no words first. They would have come later. My mom was a take charge kind of person and dad would have just helped her out. <laughs> Mary says, look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. And <laughs> he tells them, didn't you know? I'd be about my father's business. And then in verse 50 and 51, it tells us this. This is, this is what goes on but they didn't understand the statement that he spoke to them. Now, here, here's where every teenager or preteen, you need to understand, Jesus' parents didn't understand him. Your parents aren't gonna understand you either. Don't worry about it, weather the storm. And then it says, when he went down with, then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject to them. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who has flawed, frail parents that even fail, that don't understand, don't understand them. And what's he do? 
he submits himself. We don't hear anything about him until he's 30. Understand that here is the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, that is willing to submit himself to human parents. Why? Because God had placed an authority. God had given one of the Ten Commandments with a promise. Obey your father and mother for it's right. And the promise was, and you'll live long on the earth. What are we seeing in our society as far as what's going on in families? Man, there's no respect. There's no honor. Part of the reason why everything's falling apart. Just like there's no honor, there's no respect, there's no reverence in society. There's some still in the church, but it's waning. And this is why this all has to turn around. And if it's going to turn around, how's that going to happen? It's going to be a choice each one of us makes individually. And then collectively, the synergy of all of us making that choice. All right, I'm going to walk out what God's word says. I don't understand it. I don't always like it, but I'm going to do it because he is my God. He is my Lord. He is my master. I'm not going to fall prey to the same stuff that everybody who doesn't know God is doing because they think it's right. And it looks like it's right. And sometimes it sounds like it's right. And it's real easy to get sucked into it, but don't. Don't get sucked into it because there's a way that's wide that leads to death. And many go that way. So Jesus, Jesus submits. Now, we, we fast forward to near the end of Jesus' life in the earth. When he's headed towards the cross, he's standing before Pilate. Now, Pilate was an authority in the land. And we see in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 19, we see Jesus interacting with Pilate, who's about to sentence him. And here's what it says. Pilate says, you refuse to speak to me. Remember, I have power to make you free or to kill you on a cross. That'll wake you up. And yet Jesus doesn't speak to him. I want to tell you that this is something where he chooses to obey a higher authority. In Isaiah 50, 53, there are all sorts of things that are written about this time that was coming, that the Messiah would come, and it says that he stood before them as a lamb to slaughter, speaking no words. He was fulfilling what his father had for him to fulfill. He wasn't just being obstinate. And then Jesus answered Pilate, and he says this. This is so good. The only power you have over me is the power given to you by God. So he's standing there. This man is threatening him, all right? I can set you free or I can kill you on a cross. And Jesus knows. You know what? My life is in my Father's hands. This human authority God the Father has given you whatever you have and he's going to see me through whatever's going to go on. It's very different than when we stand before an authority and think that's it, they've, they've got the final say. They don't. If they don't obey God and align with God, understand God's still going to have his way. Well, how do you know that? Because God's God. We've got to get to that place where we are absolutely tenacious. We will not let go of the fact that God is God and he is Lord of our life. He is the one that's in charge. He's in control because we're giving him control all the time in our choices, in our actions, in our attitudes, in our words. And so if we've given ourselves to him, then he's got to take care of us. 
And you may say, well, it didn't go so well for Jesus. He went to the cross. That's exactly what he needed to do. I want to tell you something as, as Christians. It is not going to be a walk in the garden all the time. Your garden may be the garden of Gethsemane where you are praying and sweating blood. But you and I have to be willing to lay down our lives to trust God to use our lives however he chooses to so that his kingdom would be established, his glory would be revealed. There are times you and I go through difficult things and we wonder, God, where are you? What, what's going on? It's natural to do that, but realize that he is there and he does care. And he's working f something far bigger than we could ever imagine or dream. And it's about more than just us. There are people that are being impacted by what you're going through and them seeing you trust God. And that's hard sometimes because it hurts. And because we don't understand. But didn't we hear a scripture this morning? Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart, don't lean to your understanding. Do you see how God sets us up all the time? He's always trying to make sure we get what we need to be able to be what God has for us to be and do what God has for us to do. You know, the Bible tells us about all these people in Hebrews chapter 11 that, that had amazing things, but there are also people that didn't see what they were expecting, but they brought glory to God because of the way they lived. There was a man that was stoned. He was killed by a group of people that were told to do that because he was a Christian. And Saul, the future apostle Paul, stood there and held the coats. And when this man died, as he was dying, he said, Father, do not lay this sin to their charge. Forgive them, just like Jesus did from the cross. Forgive them. Do you know what happened in that moment? He died, but he saw Jesus, he saw the Father standing up and, and welcoming him to heaven. And, and understand that in that moment, the Apostle Paul couldn't, the future Apostle Paul could not shake what this man had done. And it was the very thing that God used to turn him to himself. Well, I don't want to have to do that. Well, then I'm sure you won't. But if you're willing to do anything for God, then he can use you any way. And it'll always be in the best way, not the most comfortable way. So th this is Jesus saying, this is who, who has all final authority. The disciples, we see in the book of Acts many times where the disciples were threatened and they were told not to do things by the authority and in Acts chapter 4, we read where the authorities had told them not to, to preach and teach. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We can't stop telling everyone, everything about what we have seen and heard. See, that's, that's the, one of the big keys who are we going to obey? Because if we don't obey God, we're going to obey some, someone else. We can't serve two masters. And if we're obeying somebody else, we can't obey God unless they're under God. And if they're out from under God, we still have to obey God no matter the threat, no matter what the result is. And so when everybody else is shooting their mouths off, about what they think about this one and that one, you and I need to guard our mouth. But what comes out of our mouth starts in our heart. So we need to guard our hearts. We need to realize as bad as that person is being and as off track as they are, they're still loved by God. Jesus still died for them. God has a plan for them. They're made in the image of God and I need to speak life over them. Not my opinion, 
not their, their faults, not their flaws, not their failures. I need to speak life. I'm telling you, if you and I will speak life to the people around us, whether they're doing right or wrong, you're going to have so many people moving toward you because they can't find that anywhere else. And God wants you to be that oasis for them. Again, there, there's another point where they're, they're arrested again because they leave here and they go back out and they start preaching and teaching. So they're arrested again, they're threatened again, and they're let go and they go back out. And they're in Acts chapter 5, verse 40. It says this. The others accepted his advice and called in the apostles and had them beaten, flogged. And they ordered them never again to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now they're getting beaten for this stuff. And I'm talking, it's not just a little tap. It is damaging to their bodies. And look at their, they don't start running their mouths against the people that just did what they did. Look what they say. The apostles left the high council rejoicing. What? Rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Now, this is so countercultural. In the church, we don't want disgrace, we want honor. I'm gonna tell you something. There are all sorts of ways that God is going to reach people, and sometimes there are things that if we are willing to give ourselves to God, we'll go through. What about the people that, that have been martyred? Throughout the ages, understand they were giving themselves to God to do something greater than just what they could do. Now, I'm not saying go out and look for it. But if you and I are really committed to God, it's, it's not something we're going to run from. We're not going to run away from being uncomfortable or being disgraced or even having things in our lives taken away because no one can take anything from us that God has given us. He'll make sure we have it. I don't have enough time, but I'm going to do my best. We see this throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel. Daniel was written, the book of Daniel was written by Daniel. It was written from a man who had been stolen from his family as, as a kid and, and brought to a foreign country and put into kind of servitude, not a menial servitude, but but in a way that he could help the country, Babylon. And we know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three teenage Hebrew kids. In the land, the king was, was encouraged to build this golden statue 90 feet tall and nine feet wide. And at the music, and the statue would kind of make a migration around, at the music, everybody was supposed to fall on their face and worship the statue. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hebrews, Hebrew teenagers, said, we can't do that. There's only one God we can worship. And so when that happened, they didn't fall down. And people reported them to the king. And the king gave them another chance. How much pressure do you think were on these teenagers? It was huge. And they played the music and everybody bowed down and they stood tall. They said, you know, this is, this is what we're, we're doing. And so the king said, listen, if you don't do it, then you're going to go into the furnace. And they didn't. And so he heated the furnace seven times hotter. The guys taking him up to throw him in the furnace died. But the three boys were okay. Another group took him up, threw him in the furnace. And you know the story. King and, and some of his other people look in and they say, didn't we throw three guys in there? And they said, yeah. Well, I, I see four. 
And this is an amazing statement. And the fourth one looks like the Son of God. How do you know that? All of a sudden, they're, they're aware of God's presence. And so he welcomes them out. And, and he makes a decree now that no one can make fun of their God. Now, that's an amazing thing because they didn't bow, they didn't bend, they didn't worship. But then in chapter six, Daniel himself is put on the spot. You're gonna be put on the spot throughout your life. If you are known to be a Christian, you're gonna be put on the spot. And we cannot afford for the lives of other people and for the glory of God and the kingdom of God, we cannot afford to compromise. No matter how hot it gets as far as people saying, well, you don't support this and you don't support this and you don't, and you're prejudiced and you don't love. You gotta know who you are and whose you are. And Daniel did. And, and a group of the authorities in the land went to the king Darius and he said, king, you know, we ought to make a law that for 30 days nobody prays to any other God than you because they thought the king was a God. And so they said, okay, let's do this. And so the king signed it into to order. And in verse 10 of Daniel chapter six, it says this. This is, this is how you know where somebody is really honoring God. It says, now Daniel knew that the writing was signed and when he went home and in his upper room with the windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, which was his custom since early days. He wasn't doing something different. He was doing what he had always done. And yet he was disregarding what the authority had said because he had to because they were telling him to do something that God would never have him do. You shall not worship. You shall not have any God before me or worship any God. And so he, he, will, he will not. He will not pray to this other God, the king. So he prays to his God, the one true God. And, and so he wasn't hiding he did it outright, and they, they, they reported him. And the crime, the, the punishment for the crime was you go into the lion's den. And so they grabbed him, they threw him in the lion's den, and the scripture tells us that an angel came and shut the lion's mouth. And the king came running to the, the lion's den looking if Daniel had survived. And when we look at verse 20 and 21, this is what we see. Then Daniel said to the king, oh, king, live forever. Do you know what? He could have said, you're a jerk. <laughs> and, and I'm showing you right now, I am, I am much better off than you. I can't believe you did this to me. Wouldn't that be one response we want to have? What did you do? And yet he says, oh, king, live forever. He's showing honor and respect for someone that didn't do what God wanted because the office deserves it. And he says, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. Before who? Before God. You and I may not be innocent before a lot of things in this world, but we, if we are innocent before God, that's all that matters. But we've got to be in line with God. And then he again says, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Because he had obeyed the authority that was above the king. And so the king says, who are the guys that told me about this, to do this? And threw Daniel into the lion's den. They threw them into the lion's den. They were eaten. But what's really amazing is verse 26. This is an amazing thing. It's awesome. The king says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. 
For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall endure to the end. Daniel went in and came out and the kingdom of God was revealed. Who the true king, who the true living God was, was revealed. You and I are going to have our lion's dens. We're going to have our fiery furnaces. But that's where we get into those places, not because we're rebellious. We are submitted to God, and we will not bend. We will not bow. We will not budge on what God has said. And God will take care of us through those things. But we still, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, O oh king, just like Daniel, O oh king, didn't pop off, didn't just run off at the mouth of what a jerk, what an idiot, what a fool he was. Still honor because that king, even though he didn't do what God had for him to do, was still set there by God. So the honor goes to the position, but God continues to reign and be followed by Daniel and by these three young men, by the disciples, by Jesus, by you and by me that we would determine that we are going to more intentionally do what the scripture says, to fear God, to have a preeminent adoration and awe of God, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ because there's value in each one of them. They're made in the image of God. God himself lives in them, so we need to show honor, we need to love, we need to care for them. We need to honor, show value to all people because they're all made in the image of God and they're people that Jesus died for. And we need to show honor to those in authority. And when they step out of their God-given position and do something against God, then we remain faithful to honor God. Amen? I'd like every head bowed, every eye closed. I would encourage you to go over the scriptures, to read about these things, because it is, it is very counterintuitive to us as human beings, because we live in a world that is so full of rebellion. It's, it was one of the first, first sins. Lucifer rebelled. One of the three archangels rebelled against God. And he still is a master at spreading rebellion. And we so often just get sucked into it because of what's going on around us and what we feel and what we think. And we can never, never see God's will fulfilled in our lives when we work in the spirit of rebellion. And we need God to, to have control of our life. We need God to govern us. We need God to guard us. We need God to guide us. And if you have never turned to the Lord and recognized that he died for you, for me, for us all, to pay the price for our sin and realize we can't make it right on our own. Nobody can pull themselves out of a hole if it's deep enough. And the hole of sin is deeper than anyone can reach except for God. That's why Jesus came down into the hole of this world and lived a sinless life and died on the cross to pay the price for our sin. And we have to recognize what he did, repent of what we've been doing, turn away from that, turn to God, and receive him as Lord, Master, Savior. If you have never received Christ as your Lord, I want to pray with you today. You at home, I want to pray with you. And if that's you here, uh, and, and you're going to pray today. You're going to say, this is, this is it. I, I, want, I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. I really want him to be my master. I want him to be the one that guides me and guards me and governs me. If you just raise your hand and say, that's me, that's me. Let's pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your son Jesus who died for my sin. Today, Lord Jesus, I come to you. 
I repent of my sin. I turn to you and I turn my life over to you. I trust in you, Lord Jesus. Be my Lord, my master, my savior, my all in all. Thank you for dying for me and being raised from the dead and being seated at the right hand of the Father for eternity. Lord Jesus, I honor you. I worship you. I'll live for you. I want you to work in my life. I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. If you prayed that prayer here for the first time, or even if you recommitted to God, you knew you were offline and you needed to get back online or at, at home, let us know. Uh, you at home, go to our website, reslifeny.org. Scroll down to where the prayer requests are. Um, let us know that you prayed today to receive Christ as your Lord. If you want us to pray for you by name, give us your name. And if you want to be contacted, give us contact information. God is so good and the world is getting so bad. And we need, we need to be a light in this world that's growing so, so dark. We need to be salt in the earth. We need to be people that don't just talk a talk. That's why they call us hypocrites. You just talk about this stuff. We have to walk the walk. We have to live the life. And it requires adjustment in all of our lives. But I will tell you this, it will be absolutely worth it when we do what God has for us to do. His kingdom abounds. His life abounds. His power and plan and provision abound. Amen? Would you stand? Before I, I pray and dismiss, um, we, we at times share about uh, families that have had losses. And, you know, whenever you have a loss, um, there's adjustment. And, and nobody ever wants to go through a loss alone. And today, I, I just want to share with you, Debbie's not here. Uh, we found out last week at this time that her sister had gone into the hospital and um, we got some calls about her progress that was not going very well. And on Thursday morning, we found out that her sister was in the ICU and they weren't sure what was going to happen, but it, they didn't expect anything good. And Debbie got on a flight and headed down to uh, North Carolina where her sister was in the hospital. And God was so good that he... Uh, <clears throat> She was able to get there to have four hours with her sister before her sister went on to be with the Lord. And it is. It's a, it's a celebration. It's a good thing that, that all of her pain is gone, all of her suffering, all the things that hindered her are gone, and it's great for her. You know, nobody's ever seen her, or like any of our loved ones that have preceded us to heaven, nobody's ever seen them in their prime. And so Linda is in her prime, and it's all good for her. But for Deb and her nieces and the rest of the family, there's a loss. And in that loss, you know, we need to hold each other's hands up and pray for each other. Um, she's headed back, but, uh, you know, it's different. It's different. But we know that we're going to see her again, and we're grateful that her suffering is over, and abundant life is just flooding and filling her. So if you would be praying for Debbie and her family, we would appreciate it. Let me pray for you before you leave. Heavenly Father, thank you for every one of your children. Thank you for your, your presence with us here, those online. Thank you, Father, that there's no place we can go that you're not there because you live in us. And you're not just there present. We're grateful for your presence. But Father, we want your participation more in our lives than ever before, knowing that you'll never force us. So Father, help us to become more aware, more sensitive, more yielded, more submissive, more available to you than ever before. That when we encounter the things we do in this fallen world, we realize we're not alone. 
and that you, you almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, the universe, everything seen and unseen, you care about us intimately and individually. And you're available to help us to walk through whatever we're facing and have the victory to bring glory to your name. We thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Have a great week.